Well, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman McGovern. Can you press the button? I think, can you hear me? I think the microphone is working. Yeah. Thank you very much for that well-informed and uh, forceful introduction, uh, Chairman McGovern and also Congressman uh, Khanna. Uh, it's a few outspoken, principled, purposeful members of Congress like these two that can make a difference can move a large and sometimes slow-moving organization like the House of Representatives. Uh, so we're glad to have you here today, and uh, we appreciate your ongoing advocacy for uh, the individual Saudi uh, activists who are in prison and, uh, and their counterparts around the world. I know the, the caucus is very active on a global scale, and so we appreciate that. And uh, your staff has been excellent in enabling, enabling us to come together uh, today. Um, but you don't want to hear from me anymore. Uh, the Congressman explained that uh, this group is in town this week because uh, PEN America each year gives the Freedom to Write Award to an imprisoned writer or writers around the world. And this year uh, we have focused on the ongoing repression in Saudi Arabia and have given the award this year to Nuf Abdul Aziz, Lujain Al Haflul, and Iman Al Afshan. Uh, three uh, very different, very smart, very principled, very outspoken women who uh, find themselves now in the clutches of an opaque uh, and repressive judicial system in Saudi Arabia. Um, we're going to divide this conversation into two pieces, if that works for you all. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Walid Al Hathlul, whose sister Lu Jane is one of our honorees this year. Um, uh, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his sister's case. And then we're joined by Malak Al Sheri whose husband was just arrested last month in uh, Saudi Arabia in a second recent wave of crackdown uh, that echoes the arrests of last May, a year ago, when uh, a number of uh, feminists and women's activists and their supporters were arrested. Uh, so we're going to have this kind of personalized discussion, and then we're going to turn to Safa al who's a journalist and filmmaker done documentaries about unrest in Saudi Arabia and is a student of the, of the uh, uh, war in Yemen and can talk about the broader implications of Saudi policy at home and in the region. Uh, and then Umayma al-Najjar is also uh, an activist uh, who's been uh, living in Israel for a number of years now. Uh, and I should say that uh, all of these women uh, here on the table are obliged to uh, live outside their country. They're living in exile because if they were to go home, they would most likely be in jail themselves. And so, and then we're going to be joined also by Sarah Leo Whitson, Human Rights Watch, who has arrived just in the nick of time, uh, uh, along with um, uh, Seth Binder from the Project on Middle East Democracy, Comed, who are going to bookend the discussion with. Uh, uh, their uh, American perspective on U.S. policy towards Saudi Arabia and, and the human rights implications thereof. So, I'm going to let Sarah catch her breath at the end of the table for a minute. Uh, so I thought we might start with uh, Walid and uh, Malak to give us kind of the personal uh, stories of their uh, sister and husband who are currently in custody. Walid, thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank first uh, Thomas Human Rights Commission, co-chaired by James McGovern, and also want to thank uh, Congressman Morcana. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, so clearly this is one of the weirdest cases I've ever seen in my life. The fact is she was you know, kidnapped. Uh, my sister, Jane, was um, you know, advocating for women's rights uh, to drive. The fact that she was kidnapped uh, where she was living in the UAE, bringing her to Saudi Arabia, uh, putting her, putting her um, travel ban, and then arresting her and putting the whole family on travel ban. This is so weird. We, and then um, when the crackdown happened, we never had any idea why she was arrested. We were was trying to find uh, why she was arrested, and we communicated through official channels. Um, trying to understand why, what is the reason behind that. Um, you know, she was when she was first arrested. That that the first month of the arrest, we didn't know where she was. So we were really that was the probably the toughest time uh, in my life when I was uh, not uh, able to know where my sister was, and uh, knowing later on that she was being tortured, uh, sexually harassed. 
in secret facilities by Saudi officials, like um, like someone who's uh, the top advisor of the Crown Prince Saud al who was, you know, awfully, overseeing the, the torture. And the fact is, um, until now, we don't know where he is. Actually, we have no idea if he is actually being being investigated in that case. Um, he was clearly involved in that case, um, making sure that uh, the torture happens in a sadistic manner. Um, the fact is, even the torture, when it was happening, the torture was not being done to extract information. The torture was happening because they were having fun. They enjoyed having uh, torturing people. And uh, that's the thing. And we're trying uh, to, to get uh, my sister out. But the fact is, still until now, there is lack of transparency in this case. Um, we haven't heard any officials saying where the case is heading. Now, the, 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 the thing is now they started the trial process, they released some of them, but still there is lack of transparency. And um, the third trial uh, was supposed to happen on <coughs> April 17. All of a sudden they canceled the trial. We don't know why they canceled it. We don't know when the next trial is going to happen. Um, and now she's pretty much in a solitary confinement in Saudi prison, in a higher prison in Riyadh. Uh, we're trying to figure out what is going to happen, when she is going to have a be released. It's not, so the crackdown is not just um, uh, one issue, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a package. It's happening with um, the travel ban, it's happening with the torture, but we have no idea what, like, we, there's no uh, um, serious actions taken by the Saudi government to investigate, investigate uh, what the media call it allegations, I call it facts. Um, these are facts that happened to my sister. Um, and the fact is, they are not taking that case seriously in terms of the torture, the bad treatment, um, even um, where Saudi Arabia is, and they are not responding uh, in officially. Um, that's something that is really weird. Uh, we didn't know why she was arrested until the day of the trial. Uh, so for 10 months you were being, sorry, uh, that was an 8 month, you didn't know why she was arrested and all of a sudden you get the list of charges on the first trial saying these are the, 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 the list of charges. And everything that was being said uh, during the, the, the crackdown when it happened, the, the Saudi media was labeling them as traitors and they are trying to um, accuse them of uh, spying on the country and dealing with you know foreign entities they don't they don't mention who these foreign entities they're saying that they are being funded by foreign entities they not they never mention these entities they like weird allegations very vague they, that can be labeled to anyone and then when we get the list of charges nothing of these charges are actually associated related to what the local media was mentioned at the beginning all of the charges, most of the charges, are related to her activism. Can you imagine someone who's applying for a job at the United Nations? Uh, that could be a child. So if you can, can you imagine if you go to the website of the United Nations and you're trying to apply for a job, you might be charged for that if you go to Saudi Arabia. That's one thing. Uh, and the thing is, Saudi Arabia is a member of the United Nations and taking this as part of it, as a child, it's so weird. Like, does that mean Saudi Arabia wants to be a member of the United Nations? I don't know. Uh, or they want to withdraw? I, I'm trying to understand that. And the thing is, Saudi Arabia has always been encouraging uh, Saudis because the quota of the Saudis in the United Nations, Nations is underrepresented, and they always wanted to encourage them. And all of a sudden, they they they, they accuse you of uh, of applying for the job in the So these, this is one of the challenges that she's facing. Um, uh, <coughs> contacting Human Rights Watch, um, contacting Amnesty International. These are like official charges in the list of charges. Um, uh, contacting foreign journalists. Uh, these are the challenges she's facing. So we're trying to have a transparent uh, process, but we are still uh, struggling with that. 
So what we really hope is um, th that there will be serious actions to uh, have like a transparent system where we can uh, know where the case is heading and where we also understand where what we're taking a serious action on the investigation of torture and also um, lifting the trouble back on my family and trying to uh, make people travel freely uh, and that's what we're trying to do. I'm just here, I'm not really an activist but I'm just advocating on the behalf of my sister. I feel like she's, uh, has been, she has been <coughs> like uh, unfair um, trial, unfair arrest from the, from the first day of her arrest. So that's what I'm trying to do is try this and raise the case on, on my sister. Thank so you. Thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank, thank you. We'll come, we'll come back to you a little bit. Um, not, mm -hmm. not oh, okay. uh, so hi, thanks for having me and giving me the chance to talk about my husband and the other uh, people who got arrested with him too. Total of them, uh, the total of the people who got arrested on uh, 5th uh, of April is uh, 15 uh, and they are they are all uh, have connection with, actually, it was a crackdown, and all of them have connection with uh, one RST, who is Muhammad Rabia, who got arrested in the crackdown that uh, Lujay al Abdul and Aziza al Yusuf uh, happened in May uh, 2018. So uh, all of them have low profile activism, uh, but for sure they are women's rights activists. Uh, Activist supporters, they supported us. Uh, they are also intellectuals. Uh, my husband, for example, is a translator. Uh, they all kept quiet. They didn't speak, they didn't even participate in their Twitter accounts. Uh, some of them are writers, uh, one of them is a photographer. Uh, but the only connection between them all is actually them being intellectuals women's rights supporters, and also they are all connected to Mohamed Rabia who got arrested in the first crackdown. Um, we don't know what are the charges yet. Uh, maybe like we had news that some of them had contact only once with their family members, but not sure too. Uh, we, have, we heard news too that they are in solitary um, uh, confinement. Um, and that's the only thing that we know about them. Uh, but the thing is that even after uh, two of them also uh, have um, uh, US uh, nationality, and uh, one of them is the son of Aziza Al Yusuf who got arrested alongside with uh, Lujay Al Hathor. So we don't know what's going on. and. Uh, we don't know what are the charges yet. They are not also uh, able to contact lawyers. Uh, and the families over there are scared even to talk about them or to send us information about them. Uh, everyone, everyone is worried, even me. Like Sometimes I think, I'm, am I doing the right thing about talking about them? But there are no choices because a lot of activists, their families, or arrestees, like not even activists, their families uh, choose to be silent, but things didn't change for them. So uh, I hear a lot of people like advise me to not talk about them, but I don't think like being quiet will do anything good for them because I know those people don't want to be forgotten. So that's why I'm talking about it. Thank you very much, Malak. Uh, now to widen the discussion a little bit more to uh, beyond the personal to the more uh, policy and systematic, I want to ask uh, uh, Safa to start the conversation and go to Omaima and then we'll have the, the bookends uh, finish up. Uh, thank you, Tom. I think uh, from the testimony of Walid and Malak, you can see quite clearly that there is a system of repression in Saudi Arabia that is bigger than just the woman activists. To me, I see what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, they're patriarchy. Obviously, they're theocracy. Obviously, they become much more of a dictatorship. But that not only reflects on how 
how little respect they have for their own citizens, but also that is reflected in the foreign policy. Um, I know Congress has been uh, pushing for resolutions against uh, the Saudi coalition's uh, war in Yemen, uh, but I think it's, it's bigger than just the Saudi coalition's war in Yemen. As you can see from the accusations that are leveled against the activists, the conflation of the two words, activism, journalism, and terrorism. And this is something that the, the government thinks will silence people from supporting them. So the, the very loose definitions of what is terrorism, and it becoming a trigger word, especially in the United States, especially in DC, they want to have people be afraid to publicly come and support them because they are being accused of terrorist acts. What is happening in Saudi Arabia is the, the definition of what is a terrorist can include uh, apostasy, can include joining us here because we are considered terrorists, so you being in the same room with us is now a crime, so they can accuse you of being in the same room with us, thus encouraging dissent in Saudi Arabia and unrest and social unrest in the country. So everything is so loose that we no longer know what is and isn't actually legal or illegal in Saudi Arabia. And I think this is deliberately done to increase this environment of fear inside the country, to silence people, so that nobody knows where the red line is anymore. And so you, you are so afraid that you stay away from everybody uh, that has been arrested. Uh, you delete their numbers. You don't want to contact their families. Uh, they make these people into pariahs. And this very problematic environment is reflected also in how the Saudi government is treating the war in Yemen. And so I've been covering Yemen since 2009. And what, what is happening inside Yemen is not only a human, uh, uh, a human catastrophe, as in uh, the country deliberately being starved by the Saudi coalition, but also the conflation of terrorism and the definition of Saudi government is reflected as well in what's happening inside Yemen, of who they deem to be a terrorist. So it's not just the Houthis. Now, the, 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 the resolutions that have been, uh, or attempted to pass, uh, about the Saudi uh, coalition war in Yemen does not include American program of counterterrorism in Yemen, which predates even September 11th. So the relationship and, and the, the forever war uh, on terrorism also includes that. How those two things intersect with the Saudi coalition on the ground since 2015 and the start of the war is extremely problematic because the Trump administration has doubled down on all the policies that the Obama administration had started of using drone strikes, but also of having raids, for example, in the first five days of the Trump administration, they had the raid on Yekla, and where the first Navy uh, SEAL was killed, and then they did several other raids, and they've increased significantly the number of drone strikes. Now, there are no more assets for the US government on the ground in Yemen, so who are they using? Whose definition of who is a terrorist is being used right now on the ground? It's the Saudi coalition. So if we're gonna agree that the Saudi government already has very problematic definitions of who is a terrorist, and then the U.S. government is also using the Saudi coalition's intelligence, quote unquote, <laughs> ironically, who are you killing on the ground, right? And these questions need to be asked because it's not only if you agree that the Saudi Arabia has a horrendous human rights track record inside Saudi Arabia domestically, should that not be inferred in how they define international terrorists? Who's Al Qaeda? Who's ISIS? And obviously I include the UAE in this because the UAE is also part of this coalition and it's actually more active on the ground uh, in, uh, in Yemen. But those questions need to be asked. Who is a terrorist in the, in the eyes of uh, the Saudi government and should the US government consider them terrorists as well? We should question these things. These are real life issues right now. The counterterrorism program that the United States um, is conducting post-2015 is heavily reliant on Right? And the number of civilian casualties in Yemen has massively increased. So I think it's disingenuous to think that just by stopping the Saudi coalition war on Yemen, that this is disconnected from the direct responsibility of the US government and who they are actually killing on the ground as well. Those two things are connected. To, to say that one is not related to the other and that the counterterrorism program should not be put in question, which is not part of the resolution, is problematic. Thank you, Saha. Uh, oh, my. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, speaking about the terrorism, I think it's also important to, to remind that uh, the Saudi government is using uh, terrorism to try.
charge the women activists that are killing them because they want them to see Masada. She's in solitary confinement for a very long time, nearly a year. And, and she's a mother of children with disabilities. And they're not only punishing her, but they're also punishing the family financially and denying them from health care. This is how horrific it is. I think Congressman, when he described that the Saudi government is ruling as if it's in the middle ages, is actually a very accurate uh, description of what, uh, human rights situation in Saudi Arabia. Um, after Jamal Khashoggi's killing, there, there was another serious of, uh, arrest and crackdown on uh, women rights activist supporters, and they carried a mass execution uh, despite the uh, Human Rights Council uh, meeting in the United Nations. So they're testing the boundaries again and again. Every time they go away with a the crime, they, they carry out another horrific crime. And I believe it's time to, uh, to hold Saudi Arabia uh, accountable for the crimes they committed, not only for the Manus Khashoggi's killing and the arrest of women, but also for the mass execution that was carried out in which uh, more than 30 activists were accused of terrorism, were executed, beheaded, like literally the Middle Ages style, and, and uh, some of them even pinned to a pole just to, to send a message to other activists, uh, and they were mostly from the Shia community. Um, it's, it's time to hold them accountable, it's time to bring those who are involved uh, to justice, and it's time to, to put some res resolutions that are serious, not only in paper, but to, to actually bring those who are involved to justice. And um, let me see. I think that uh, uh, one of the things that it's also important to mention that Saudi Arabia had a long list of people who are on death penalty and they're activists and human rights defenders. And if we are not to do anything about this uh, uh, very soon, we will have another mass execution that will be carried out. Thank you. Can I just add some of them were minors? So, yes. Some, some of the activists that were arrested actually were minors at the time, 17 and 16 year olds, some of them were college students. And, and this is one of the things that they're doing. They're, only, they're not only punishing the activists, but also punishing the family members, the friends, or anybody who's affiliated with them. Uh, and in terms of the women rights activists who are temporarily released, they're, they're in some sort of house arrest. They're banned from uh, which, you know, writing or stuff doing any sort of activity, either work or, you know, uh, becoming uh, activists again. So this is not even a true uh, release. Um, and I believe that although the media has been publishing how happy that they, that the women were released, they keep on missing the point that they're under house arrest and being under surveillance uh, and being watched. So. Um, and, and, and one of the recent activities that the Saudi government is doing is actually using women against women in the, in the Shura Council, uh, where they are actually calling women rights activists as terrorists, and they're comparing them to men who flee the country to join the terrorist groups. Women, they're comparing women who run away from the country uh, and as a terrorist, like the men who join the terrorist groups. That's how I, I run it. This. And I, I believe that uh, the, the, the terrorism definition, the loose definition of terrorism in Saudi Arabia uh, puts everybody at risk. Children, women, human rights defenders, women activists. And, and it's time to uh, not only for Saudi Arabia to put clear definition on what's a terrorist and what's, who's a terrorist, what, what is terrorism, but also to, to end those uh, horrific human rights violations and bring, uh, bring the Saudi officials, senior officials who were involved with them, Jamal Khashoggi's killing or the torture of women like Saudi uh, or, uh, uh, or those who were involved in committing war crimes in Yemen. That should be also discussed that has been quite underreported in the, in the past years. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Leah, welcome. Uh, so, thank you uh, to the Lantos Commission for organizing this briefing on women's human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. It is so important that we keep a spotlight uh, on these ongoing detentions. Um, but it's now almost been one year that the Saudi government detained the 15 women's human rights defenders 
immediately prior to lifting the driving ban in June 2018. And what should have been heralded as an important reform measure to address the legally prescribed subjugation and discrimination of women in Saudi Arabia, which is no doubt the most extreme in all of the Middle East and North Africa, became instead a fresh declaration of the government's absolutism. Only Saudi Arabia's unelected leaders would decide what changes would be made in the kingdom, and they would severely punish any citizens who dared to advocate for those very same changes. So the arrest of the men and women who had advocated for many years to lift the driving ban against women, end the archaic guardianship system over women, and allow women to vote in elections for even the toothless municipal councils, all things the government has now done or said it will do, must be seen in the context of an absolutist monarchy for whom there is nothing more threatening than the free voices of its citizens calling for reform. The arrest and persecution of Saudi women's rights defenders didn't start under the present King Salman and the de facto ruler, his son, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And I think we will hear uh, more, for example, about the ongoing detention of Raif Badawi since 2012 under the prior king. But they have escalated and reached a scale of magnitude and brutality we have never before documented in the kingdom. I want to name the activists in these mass arrests because having their names shared here in a congressional briefing is our own declaration to them that we are fighting against their unjust persecution and stand in solidarity with them. So, Lujain al Hathloul, Aziza al Yusuf, Iman al Nafshan, Nuf Abdul Aziz, Maya al Zahrani, Hatun al Fassi, Sam al Badawi, who is the sister of Raif Badawi and remains detained without any charge at all, Nasima al Sadah, Shadin al Ronezi, and Amal al Hafi. Other rights groups have identified additional women detainees, including Abir Namankani and Nuf al Dosari. They also included men, including lawyer Ibrahim al Mudaymir, activist Muhammad al Rabia, and businessman Abdul Aziz al Mashal not to mention the additional arrests of family members like Ayman. Aldris. These are some of the brightest lights of Saudi Arabia, the courageous men and women who fought for the values we universally hold dear, for the benefit of all their fellow citizens. We've documented very serious allegations of extreme torture of several of the women activists, including beatings, whippings, and electric shocks. One has tried to commit suicide as a result. Lujain and Hathloul, you've just heard from her brother, who was most recently recognized by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, described to her family when they came to meet her how she was beaten, waterboarded, given electric shocks, sexually harassed, and threatened with rape and murder. Writing about Lujain for Time, I described her as a model of Saudi womanhood for her brave struggle for women's rights at great personal cost. The attack against Lujain is an attack against all Saudi women. It is important to note that two of the women said that Saud al Kahtani oversaw their torture. In case his name doesn't ring a bell, let me remind you that the notorious Mr. Kahtani was apparently the Crown Prince's brutal enforcer. He was also implicated in overseeing the kidnapping, murder, and dismemberment of my friend Jamal Khashoggi last year, as well as the surveillance and threats against several Saudi activists living abroad. He's apparently still roaming free in the kingdom with no accountability. It might not surprise you that the Saudi government has absolved itself of all responsibility for torturing and detained women with two investigations by the government-controlled Human Rights Commission and the public prosecutor, which of course reports directly to the royal court. The public prosecution spokesperson confirmed this on March 1 when he told local media that investigations into the torture claims found, surprise, surprise, no evidence to support them. 
Meanwhile, government-aligned media outlets have carried out an alarming campaign against them, branding them as traitors, though the charges against them include absurd allegations, as, as Malid mentioned, of applying for a job at the UN and talking to foreign media and human rights organizations. This is what the prosecutor has actually offered as evidence of their undertaking what the prosecutor has described as coordinated and organized activities, I'm quoting, that aim to undermine the kingdom's security, stability, and national unity. But contrary to the statements by the Crown Prince, the charges against the activists appear nearly all related to their peaceful human rights work. The government has temporarily released several of the women, but their trial is proceeding. These are temporary releases. And three on trial remain in detention, two without charge. The court hearing the central case against most of the activists postponed its verdicts on both April 17 and April 24 without explanation. We now expect the final rulings in June after Ramadan. There are several congressional pieces of legislation that propose important measures of accountability, including targeted sanctions on the Saudi Arabian government officials complicit in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, as well as war crimes and other serious violations of the laws of war in Yemen. Congress can and should ensure any bill that becomes law also includes accountability for the persecution of women's rights activists. There is one bill, the Saudi Arabia Human Rights and Accountability Act, H.R. 2037, introduced by Congressman Malinowski, my former colleague and now Congressman for New Jersey 7th District, which does address the persecution of women, and it is well worth supporting. Whether these bills will be enforced given the current political climate, where our president has made clear that he prioritizes economic gains from arms sales above any abuse by the kingdom's leaders, no matter how heinous, remains a question. But that's not a reason for Congress to refrain from action. What's just as important is for the executive branch, namely the White House, to recognize that its words and statements assuring the kingdom that there will, in fact, be no consequence for their abuses, that indeed this administration will stand by them no matter how lawless and sadistic their actions, play an important role in encouraging abuses to continue. The very minimum the Trump administration can do is to stop its vice signaling, if it can't bear to virtue signal. We hear assurances that they privately told the Saudis that they should release these activists, if for no other reason than the damage their conduct continues to cause their reputation and undermines other agenda items in the region. Clearly, the Saudis are not listening. And so, if nothing else, this administration should recognize how unreliable, <coughs> reckless, and unstrategic the government of Saudi Arabia remains, unable to restrain itself from even the most unnecessary and self-harming outrages. Without consequence, we can expect to see unrepentant and emboldened abuses by the Saudi government. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, having clean up, Seth. <laughs> Can I just add a brief thing, Sarah? Just to clarify, the name Sarah, I had read out loud, only the tip of the iceberg of the actual political prisoners in Saudi Arabia. We only know about these names because we have courageous family members and friends who have reported them. But that does not in any way reflect the depth and the expanse of what the government has actually done. So we actually don't know what the number, the real number of the political arrests is. Thanks, Tom. And, and thank you to the Land Justice Commission. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it, it's, it's inspiring to be up here with all these panelists um, and from your creative work. I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, we've heard so much already, uh, but I really want to focus on U.S. policy. Um, and so, seemingly lured by promises of billions in weapon sales, the Trump administration has fully embraced the Saudi regime, lending support to the Crown Prince's increased repression of Saudi citizens. Rather than hold the regime accountable and publicly demand the immediate release and exoneration of the women's rights defenders, the administration has continued to offer tacit support for the Saudi leadership sham trial. A bipartisan and bicameral group of legislators, though, have taken some important but symbolic steps to push back on Saudi Arabia's oppressive policies 
and clearly run, that clearly run an anthem to U.S. ideals and interests. In a unanimous, unanimously approved resolution stating directly that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is responsible for the murder of Jamal, <coughs> Jamal Khashoggi, the Senate called upon the Saudi government to release women for its activists in 2018. And Republican and Democratic senators, led by the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Menendez, introduced legislation that would prohibit the transfer of numerous weapon systems and require a report from the State Department on the human rights record of Saudi Arabia, including its treatment of women. In the House, Representative Frankel and a bipartisan group of 26 co-sponsors introduced a resolution condemning the Saudi government's treatment of women, urging the kingdom to immediately, immediately release the detained women's rights defenders and end the male guardianship laws, and calling on the administration to prioritize human rights, including women's rights, in the U.S.-Saudi relationship. And Representative Malinowski, as just mentioned, introduced legislation that bans anyone connected with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi from entering the United States until, among other conditions, the Saudis have taken verifiable steps to repeal the guardianship laws. While Congress has taken some initial steps to demonstrate its frustration with the current U.S.-Saudi relationship and the Trump administration's unfettered support for the Saudi regime's repressive and impetuous policies, Congress can and must do more to reshape U.S. foreign policy towards Saudi Arabia. This needs to include more emphasis on the rights of women in Saudi society, and it can, it can begin to do so uh, by following these steps. Congress should pass H.R.S. 129, which was introduced by Representative Frankel, and unanimously passed by the House Foreign Affairs Committee yesterday. To, this will express strong disapproval of the Saudi government's treatment of women. <laughs> this resolution would send a strong signal of Congress's displeasure with Saudi actions, but it is not enough. Congress must pass legislation that imparts real penalties on the Saudi regime for countering U.S. interests, including the detention of Saudis simply trying to push for gender equality. Currently, there are a variety of legislative options available in both the House and Senate. Congressional action should include targeted U.S. sanctions on Saudi individuals responsible for human rights abuses, against the women's rights defenders. Sanctions legislation should also provide incentives for the kingdom to carry out legitimate reforms, including the release of all human rights defenders, bloggers, journalists, and civil society activists, including the women's rights activists, activists arrested in May 2018. The end of the male guardianship system, adherence to the UN Convention Against Torture, holding all officials and security forces who are responsible for human rights abuses accountable for their crimes, allowing for public criticism and freedom of expression within the political sphere, and ceasing all enforced repatriations, disappearances, arrests, and travel bans on individuals perceived as oppositional to the regime. By taking these steps, Congress would begin to realign the relationship and send a strong signal to the Saudi government that it is in the U.S. interest that Saudi women no longer be considered legally and socially a minor. The Crown Prince's foreign and domestic policies are indicative of a power-hungry, reckless leader whose reforms are hollow and outweighed by his escalation of repression. He may have lifted the driving ban, but his arrest of the women's rights defenders who advocated for lifting the ban and the continuation of the guardianship laws proves the reforms are devoid of substance. Just two weeks ago, we learned that American intelligence warned Saudi and non-Saudi activists based outside the kingdom that there were credible threats against their lives by the Saudi regime. Clearly, the Crown Prince and his henchmen believe they will continue to act with impunity, and it is incumbent upon Congress to take the necessary steps to ensure that our longtime partner understands that its actions have consequences. The United States can maintain a positive, mutually beneficial relationship with the Saudi government, but only if the U.S. government is willing to push back on the regime's worst abuses. Moreover, if the Saudi government hopes to advance Vision 2030 and create a country that enriches the lives of its citizens, it must unleash the skills of half its population for the betterment of Saudi Arabia and its people. Great. Thank you very much, Seth, um, for refocusing us, refocusing us on what's happening here on Capitol Hill and the legislative vehicles that are now uh, in various stages of uh, consideration. Um, we at uh, Penn America, of course, uh, the writer's organization, uh, think that words matter. And I think that it's a, 
one way to wind this up is to talk about the words we use when we talk about uh, the relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, too often we refer to it as an alliance or an ally. Uh, and it's not really an ally in anything uh, worthwhile uh, in that um, uh, anything that reinforces or strengthens the repressive system in Saudi Arabia is working against the ideals that have been spoken, spoken to so, so well by Congressman McGovern and Congressman Khanna. Um, and so I want to um, wind this up and ask that uh, those of you who have specific questions uh, for uh, any of our panelists, um, we can talk informally when we break up. We're going to have to move down the hall in a few minutes to another meeting uh, with individual members of Congress who are anxious to hear from our visitors from, from Saudi Arabia. So uh, given the late hour and uh, all that, I'm going to uh, forego the usual Q&A session at the end of uh, these kinds of briefings, uh, but invite you to mingle informally when we break up here for uh, about five or ten minutes before we have to move on. Uh, and with that, I want to thank uh, uh, Kim and Rosie in particular from the uh, Land Coast Commission staff for putting this together. I want to thank all of you who came out this morning to hear from our visitors. Um, we are uh, launching with this award this week, the Freedom to Write Award. We're launching a sustained advocacy campaign ourselves as Pan America for these three women and the wider community of uh, writers and speakers and activists uh, that they're emblematic of. So uh, you'll be hearing more from us. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more from our Poment and from Human Rights Watch. Uh, and uh, we'll try to echo the voices of the, the Saudis who live in this, uh, uh, this situation, particularly those who have family members uh, in custody right now, uh, and those who are obliged to live outside their country in exile because they're not allowed to return home, uh, as is the case with Omaima and Sabah, um, as well as with uh, Walid and uh, Malak, who uh, if they were to return, would be trapped in Saudi Arabia, would not be allowed to travel, and might well end up in custody themselves. Um, so uh, we're all more grateful that they've had the courage uh, to come out and share their stories <coughs> with us and their analysis. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you all, and we'll conclude. Thank you.